Welcome to worship at First Christian Church, Paris, Kentucky, for September 20th, um, 2020. We are now on 11 out of 12 Sundays where we've had perfect weather. Isn't that great? Now, before we get, <clears throat> before we get too confident, um, one Sunday we looked up in the sky and there was a cross. Uh, two planes had made... Uh, had crossed their contrails and there was a beautiful cross in the sky we took pictures of it and shared it on facebook and people were ooh and ah and god's at work well uh, i have to tell you this morning a vulture circled over top <laughs> so uh you know you might want to like move a little bit you know before uh you get settled in too much um our committee for reopening has met and we've decided to return to worship inside. Um, uh, it's, go it's going to get colder uh, today. If we'd had an usher, we would have been saying, uh, would you like shade or no shade, you know? But um, uh, so we'll be back inside on October the uh, 4th um, and we will require uh, that we take your temperature and we will ask if you need a mask. Uh, you will be ushered to your seat, and uh, which is all marked off for social distancing. Uh, we request that you come a little early, uh, so there won't be you know a big long line. You can enter through the uh, ramp door and uh, line up in the hall of history uh, to be uh, checked and then seated. We'll do the same thing with communion. You'll pick up your communion. Uh, we'll have a basket for offerings, and uh, we'll go from there. And uh, I know some people are uncomfortable with moving back inside, but the only alternative is not to meet together um, and just be online. So we hope that that um, uh, we know we know we'll lose some folks when we move inside, but um, uh, this is just kind of the nature of what we're going through. Oh, and we're also going to try to be do live streaming, um, and. Uh, um, what else can I say about that? We'll be live, <laughs> and then it'll be uh, it'll be automatically uploaded to the internet, so you can still watch it later on if you want to. But um, we're going to work on that and see if that uh, see if we can make that happen. We want to thank everyone for participating in the service today, and uh, I now invite Andrea forward for recognition of children, youth, and our teachers. Morning. How is everybody? Good. All right. First, I'm going to introduce. I'm going to talk about our youth that promote that are promoting up. Here at First Christian, we have as the, the older they get, the more things they get to participate in, and then you know, and then as you get to a certain age, there are less things that you maybe get. You outgrow things. You grow into things, and then you outgrow. Uh, activities that we have but our biggest transition is from elementary to middle and high school um, so we have elementary youth group we have elementary Sunday school and we have a lot of other activities that elementary kids participate in youth choir acolyting worship and wonder um, and once you hit once you move into sixth grade you you don't get to, you get to move into Cairo and CYF youth group you get to move into middle and high school Sunday school you get to no longer participate in worship and wonder as a participant but you get to be a youth greeter so there are things that you grow out of and grow into and and so our biggest transition is our sixth our fifth graders that moved up into sixth grade this year and we have five young ladies that moved up so if the, all I'm asking is these five girls, if you are here today, I'm going to say your name. You're going to stand up and wave to me, wave to everybody. And then after service, you can meet me at the blue tent. I have a cool little certificate for you because you all are awesome. So our five girls are Addison Underwood, Audrey Gonzalez, Bella Jett, Brooklyn Sebastian and Lily Adler 
So those five girls get to start hanging out with the cool big kids. They are now considered the cool big kids. So I am very proud of them. They are doing great. All right. And now every year we do Operation um, Stuff the Bus. And we ask congregation to help supply classroom our teachers here within our congregation help supply their classrooms with goodies so i'm also i'm going to reckon we have six teachers in our congregation and we have 12 others that help somewhere within the school system or ch or after school child care um, so i'm going to recognize these people as i say your name and what you do for our children here in the community, just wave. Uh, after the service, you can meet me at the blue tent. I have a goodie bag with everybody's name on it, and it has a little something for you all to supply your classroom or bus or office or cafeteria with something very awesome. So I'm going to start with Leanne Franks, elementary art teacher at Bourbon County. She's way back in the back. Ashley Norris, director of Houndtown and after, tw after School 21st Century at Paris. <laughs> Sammy Wilson, elementary special ed teacher at Bourbon County. <laughs> Jamie Daly, she just got a promotion to academic dean at Bryan Station. Uh, Samantha Brown, middle school teacher at Paris. Ann Davison, middle school teacher at Bourbon County. We have, now we're going to go into the other uh, teachers or leaders within our school system. Susan Bell, college professor. Jen Adler is an associate professor. Patty Caswell, substitute teacher. She's actually in a full-time position or a, as a sub for a counselor at Scott County. Uh, Marilyn Campbell, substitute teacher. <laughs> Melody Smart, substitute teacher. Kim Cox, cafeteria manager at Paris. Christy Walters, school counselor at Bourbon. Judy Audi, count, uh, Central Office at Bourbon County. Allison Smith, Bus Monitor for Bourbon. Roger Caswell, Bus Driver at Bourbon. Tracy Puckett, Daycare Owner here in Paris. Jordan Clark Sexy, Daycare um, Worker at the YMCA here in Paris. Thank you all for all you do for our youth, not only within our church, but out in the community. You all are awesome. And uh, if you all will meet me afterwards at the table, I'll have something special for you guys. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord of life and love, infuse us with hope and joy. Lift us out of despair. Empower us to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins. 
Hear our prayers and answer them in ways we can understand and use. And may your still small voice whisper your message into our hearts. May we, through song and the word, through giving and the table, be brought closer to your kingdom on earth and in heaven. Amen. Let me walk close to thee, just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. This world of toil and snare If I falter, Lord, who cares Who with me my burden share None but Thee, dear Lord None but Thee Just a closer walk with Thee Granted, Jesus is my plea Daily walking close to Thee Let it be, dear Lord Let it be I deeply appreciate Doris coming at the last minute, last night about 7 o'clock. We found that uh, Liz Yeiser has tested positive for COVID. She has no symptoms, but of course she has to quarantine. And uh, so I gave uh, Doris the list of hymns that I had, but Vicki and, and uh, Liz have the total freedom and it's perfectly fine to change the hymns. So when Doris came this morning, all the hymns had been changed and and that was fine, but uh, so you'll be getting some solos this morning, which is absolutely wonderful. All right, there you go. Just a closer walk with thee reminds me of the jazz funerals in New Orleans where they would play slow and march through the streets and a jazz band would play just a closer walk with thee and coming back from the cemetery, marching down the street, they would play when the saints go marching in to celebrate the resurrection. So let's do uh, keep Liz uh, in our prayers. David has tested negative, and um, uh, their daughter uh, Katie is coming in from the West Coast to get away from the smoke, from the fires for just a little while. It's just so oppressive there. Uh, we remember the family of Helen Parsons who died this week, and her service was yesterday at the Paris Cemetery. All those who knew and cared about Mary Ann Smith, who died this week, and her funeral was yesterday at the Paris Cemetery. Judy Otte will have surgery uh, on September 30th, outpatient surgery. Ruth Miller uh, just moved in and will be living with Chatty and uh, Chad and Chatty. I so wish he was here. I've done that a few times before. Chad and Patty Fuller. Um, and uh, certainly we want to pray for Chad and Patty real struggle right now to gain weight um, and uh, uh, is trying to uh, trying to do that and it's a struggle uh, we want to pray for Bourbon Heights who had their first positive tests for COVID um, the staff member that tested positive the next day tested negative uh, and there are three residents that are being tested and monitored uh, there is a a detailed plan to deal with this and but so far um, uh, Bourbon Heights had not had a positive case which is amazing in, in a facility uh, with so many people close together 
Uh, we want to pray for David O'Neill, a friend of Kathy Caldwell, uh, the husband of Sandy O'Neill. want to pray for Gerald Fields, Sharon Fields' brother in Portland uh, with the fires. We also want to pray for Sharon's uh, church that she serves in Carlisle, First Christian Church. Um, they have not been together or been online, either one, um, for now going on six months. Um, I want to pray for the family of Lavana Snell, who apparently um, died this week. Um, we want to pray for the folks on the uh, Gulf Coast who are victims of repeated hurricanes and tropical storms and uh, those affected by the fires in the West. Uh, and also we want to keep in our prayers uh, Don Hiles. And I want to ask Chad to come down here for a second. While he's coming down, I want to tell you all my scans are clear and I have no more infusions. Yay! So, Yay! Wow, that's awesome. That is awesome. Well, um, here, and right here. Um, 37 years ago today, we welcomed uh, a little baby boy into our family. And uh, we named him after my father, and we named him Charles Browning Bell II. Uh, and we decided to call him Chad. He was born in North Carolina. And um, I cannot tell you what an incredible blessing uh, that he has been, um, uh, even down to his sense of humor. Uh, so this morning, um, I decided to serenade him uh, on his birthday. And I was singing, Oh, Happy Day. Um, and there's a story behind that. but And I was putting new words to it. And uh, he was putting his hands over his ears. And, and uh, so I kept singing it when we got here to the church. And I said, Chad, why do you not like my singing? And he said, because you're flat G. <laughs> flat G. That's all I got. So... Um, I just cannot tell you what a blessing this guy is to me and to the world. And I love you, Chad. Okay. Happy birthday. Thanks, Daddy. Okay, go back and sit down. All right. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, when death comes to our church family, and we are sad. Remind us that such times are yet full of joy and rejoicing as we remember your promise of eternal life and a glorious heavenly kingdom where you will welcome us and where you have gone to make a place for us. And so comfort those who grieve. <coughs> comfort us as a church family in times of loss. We pray for those who need surgery, those who are going for tests, those who are awaiting results of tests. We pray for those who have tested positive for COVID-19 with or without symptoms and for the ordeal that they will go through in quarantine and or treatment. We pray for Bourbon Heights and the complicated and detailed work that must be done to keep the residents and the staff safe there. We pray for churches struggling in such a time of pandemic, struggling to be together, but to be together safely and wisely. And for the churches that cannot be together or have chosen not to be in person together, or do not have the facility to allow that to happen. We thank you for the ability to gather in a facility large enough for us to separate and distance. We celebrate days of rejoicing when we celebrate another year passing in our lives. We celebrate what has been and what is yet to come. When disaster comes upon any section of our country, we pray for the thousands of people who are affected 
for the, for the first responders who, who arrived to help, for those who must get to work and yet whose homes have been destroyed. We thank you for healing and for hope. We thank you for days such as these, beautiful days, to gather outdoors in your kingdom. And though it's a little cool, we still thank you for uh, creating a sanctuary in this place and in this space. Walk with us on our journey today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lead us and guide us in the path you would want us to walk. For it is in the name of the risen Christ we pray. Amen. This morning is from Philippians chapter 1. Beginning with verse 20. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh. That means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I may hear about you will know that you're standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you're having the struggle that you saw I had, and now he is that I still have. May God bless the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. When Kathy Caldwell and I go to the Chillicothe Correctional Institute, in Ohio to visit Tyrone Ballou, who's been on death row there for, um, or been on death row in some facility for about 26 years now. Um, we uh, park our cars and leave everything in the car, uh, everything but our ID or driver's license, and we walk to the receiving facility. Uh, we walk in, place our keys to the car in a little locker, uh, get checked in. You have to call in advance for reservations. They check us out. Uh, we go through a metal detector. They stamp our hand with something that can be seen under uh, black light. And then we are led through eight different locked doors, all of which when they slam behind you, uh, almost shake the ground. They're so heavy uh, and, uh, um, and solid. We were walked through an outer building, uh, through that building into the actual prison facility, and we are taken into the waiting area uh, to, to wait for Tyrone to be brought to us or he's either already there. The waiting area is the first floor of uh, several floors of cells. 
are no prisoners in this area, but it is a cell block. And we go and we sit down at a table. The table is firmly anchored in the ground. The seats are attached to the table, so the seats cannot move. Uh, when Tyrone is there, he is uh, uh, chained to the floor, but his hands are uncuffed. And we have a wonderful visit. We usually stay all day with him. But as we're sitting there, uh, and looking at him over his shoulder, we can see a cell just like a cell that he stays in uh, 23 of 24 hours a day. And that cell is about four, maybe four and a half feet wide, and it's eight feet long. It has a metal bed that hangs from the wall with a very thin mattress. Uh, there is a toilet that is bolted to the floor and a sink bolted to the wall. And that's where he lives. He can have some personal possessions, some books. Uh, he has a television, no cable or anything like that. Whatever station he can get, uh, what he can watch on his television. And he's so excited when uh, UK plays on CBS. Look at that setting. I imagine that I would not want to stay, even if there's a really some kind of role play. Um, I would want to stay in one of those cells locked in. A lot of the cells have windows. Uh, I think Tyrone now has a window. And your thought is to write a letter. So he writes to the church. That, but it's a great letter. Full of encouragement and instruction. I'm absolutely sure they took this letter and gathered everybody around and read the letter out loud. Held it up for everybody to see. I doubt if they passed it around. It was probably too fragile. But they probably read it so much that the paper began to wear on the edges. And they must have <clears throat> found a way to copy, hand copy the letter uh, so it would survive. These words were written in brutal, oppressive, and grim circumstances. They were greeted with elation when received at the church. These believers were hungry and thirsty to be taught the path on which to walk in faith.
as expected, we wonder why. Do we think as soon as we make that good confession of faith and rise from the waters of baptism that life will be all goodness and light? The first thing Paul does in this passage is examine where he is spiritually and physically. and understanding where he is and what's really going on in the bar and realizing that the bars and the jail cell uh, do not confine him, do not confine his spirit, nor do they confine him to God. At first, he's not sure whether he prefers life or death, but he knows he needs to prepare for death. He might very well be executed, depending on the day and the mood of the authorities. But eventually he chooses life because the churches that he serves need him. He embraces death as a possibility and prepares for it and says, it would be gain if I die and go to heaven. Now this is our first powerful lesson. Paul deals with the awful consequence of dying. His conclusion is that if it's God's will, then dying would be gain and heaven would be a worthy destination. In this dark and desperate place, Paul determines that he can write a letter and rather than sit and worry and stew and be afraid, he proclaims one of the most uplifting and inspiring pieces in the New Testament. He can't be there, he can't travel, he may die soon, but today he can write a letter. A few weeks before Helen Parsons' death, she was quite frustrated. She could not hear. She could not see very well. Uh, she couldn't see to do her crossword puzzles anymore. She was ready to go. And what did she do? She sat down and wrote her offering check to the church with the help of Nancy Adams, who was staying with her. And then we met with Operation Food Basket and announced Helen's death. And Mary Pohasi, the treasurer, said, yes, I think we just received a check from Helen. So as she was declining, she determined what it was that she could do, that she could still do for the glory of God. Paul knew five things. Paul knew he had his work, that he had his faith, that he has either life or death, and either will suit him. Fourth. He has hope in life and in death. And fifth, he has something to say for God. Do you remember the time when Paul uh, was in jail and he didn't waste any time. He converted a jailer and a bunch of inmates and, and uh, he made jail church. The second thing Paul does is tell the Philippians to find their joy. Find your joy. Likely they weren't rich and didn't have much power. They were certainly being persecuted. They did not have favored status in the empire like the church does today in the United States. Many would have avoided the church like the plague. It looked like they walked around with a target on their back. Their leader had been crucified. Their apostle was in jail and might be executed. And Paul says, look for the joy. Yesterday at 1 o'clock was the graveside service for Mary Ann Smith. Mary Ann um, was 87 years old, and she had uh, moved back here from White Plains, New York, with her mother, who was from here, um, many years ago. And they lived in an apartment at, uh, on High Street and Boone, at the intersection of High Street and Boone. Mary Ann was very quiet. Um, she uh, didn't have a lot to say. She didn't like to participate in the activities uh, at Bourbon Heights, and um, she had no remaining family. So it was very possible that the funeral uh, at the cemetery would have been me and the two funeral directors. But that's not what happened. What happened was that two of the employees of Bourbon Heights came. One named Wendell brought a laundry basket full of family albums. 
And he said, I found these in her uh, storage facility down in the basement. And it would be such a tragedy to just take all these beautiful family photos and just throw them away. What can we do with them? So we picked them up out of the laundry basket and held them up and talked about how, um, how Mary Ann certainly had the images of those events and days and times uh, in her mind and in her heart and, had, uh, and knew those albums even though she didn't keep them in her room. And then Morgan Mingy came, uh, the activities director, and, um, uh, and she read scripture and was there both on days when they were off from their work at Bourbon Heights. As so often happens, uh, Marie Smart came. Uh, she comes to as many of the funerals as she can possibly make, and Marie was there. And then there were two other people, and I had no idea who they were, and I knew they couldn't be family. And so I walked back and introduced myself, and it turns out that uh, this man and wife um, owned the apartment building where Marianne lived, and of course it had been seven or eight years since they'd had any contact with Marianne, but they came. And I, I looked at them and I said, you know, you didn't have to do this. Nobody would have known. Nobody would have thought any less of you if you hadn't come, but you took a little time to come here today to honor the memory of Mary Ann Smith. And it was um, um, a joyful moment in what could have been um, three people, you might say, doing their jobs uh, before she was to be buried. It was a glorious moment of joy. You and I will not lose our capacity to find and express joy. Just again, back and imagine the Apostle Paul and where he was in the context he was when he thought these words and composed them and wrote them down. Paul opens his letter to the Philippians in this way. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making, um, for all of you making my prayer with joy, thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. You'd think Paul was sitting in his study in his nice home uh, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea somewhere, feeling the cool breeze coming off the ocean. So how do we recover joy from despair? The first thing it seems to me with the Apostle Paul is he's saying, look for it. Look for it. First, joy may be in a memory that we need to recall. Paul remembers from the dark prison cell. Most likely he's underfed and underattended. Maybe he has an ailment that is not being addressed. Surrounded by grungy, dangerous, smelly criminals. And he remembers the good people of Philippi and rejoices in them remembering. Secondly, joy uh, may just be on the flip side of our circumstances. I discovered when I was in the hospital for a month when I was 19, missing the second and third quarters of my college experience, uh, that uh, there was a lot of downtime. I was just receiving infusions of antibiotics every day, and that's why I was in the hospital, so I had a lot of uh, time on my hands and was alert and awake. And, and so as people sent me candy and flowers, and I, I would turn around and, and make my room the, the gathering place for the medical staff who could come in and get candy and flowers and whatever else uh, had been brought to me. I just turned around and shared those things back. And Rather just laying, than laying back and being served, it was a way to seek a little joy at the time, to get to know people. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I remember, remember that uh, fondly, even though I was quite sick. About a month ago, I wrote a thank you letter to, to um, Baptist Health. Uh, I took it to radiology, I took it to the infusion center, uh, and to the oncology office. And one of the sentences there said, everyone has been kind and helpful and hopeful. Hopeful. There has been the right measure of humor and patience. 
You've perfected your professionalism and yet retained your warmth. On occasion, you have spoken of faith as a part of the path of healing and yet never denied the science. I asked the doctor on my next appointment, did he get my letter? He said, well, yes, not only did uh, we get your letter, but it was sent out by email to every employee in the Baptist Health System, and it made it up to the vice president's office. Now, wasn't that fun? Um, find the joy. Third, each of us must know the joy is there to be discovered under whatever circumstances we find. Even if we can't see it at first, we just keep looking. It's all around us. It's within us. Maybe we can't change the external circumstances. Maybe nothing will change about that. Disease, death, uh, a measure of despair. But somewhere in there is the joy. Then Paul says, find your people. But see, what Paul knew is everybody uh, were his people. There he was in prison. He looks around. He looks into the next cell. There are his people. The jailer comes and makes a snarky comment or uh, whips him or whatever jailers were to do. Paul knew the jailer uh, was his people. Um, even Rome, they were his people. Secondly, his people were out there in Philippi looking to hear from him. They were sinners and saints and whole and broken as successes and failures. He found his people and lit up with a purpose and then wrote that letter. And again, at third, it takes advanced, an advanced Christian to realize that even strangers are your people. Strangers are your people. Back in the day when we were able to go any place we wanted to go and meet anybody we wanted to meet, uh, one day I got to thinking about errands I was running and places I was going, and I realized I had encountered maybe 20 strangers that day in terms of uh, making contact in businesses um, and going to hospitals and uh, talking to receptionists and uh, so if, if we do not welcome the stranger, if we do not see them as our people, uh, then we have missed a lot. Your enemies, number five, your enemies might even be your people. This is really advanced Christianity. Uh, forgive them, allow them to forgive you, and build bridges. Six, finding your people helps you get out of your own self-centered pity. And seventh, find people who can advocate for you. If you have problems with alcohol, join Alcoholics Anonymous. If you have a handicapped child, find an organization that helps families uh, with children with that particular disability. And then Paul tells us to find a reason for our suffering. First, learn from what afflicts you. Secondly, uh, if your suffering got your attention, did it make you appreciate life more? Third, make sense out of what makes no sense. Have a plan, seek help, be good to yourself, know that God is with you. Fourth, who will meet, who will you meet and how will you grow through the experience? Fifth, welcome encouragement. Sixth, have a goal. Paul gives them wonderful encouragement when he says, only live your life in the manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. He doesn't get real specific there, but he gives them words into which they can live in their own faith and their imaginations. From struggles such as these, the church was formed and grew and spread across the known world. He does what he's able to do and no more, and the church does what it can do and no more, and God intervenes and allows the seeds planted by these fledgling churches and this apostle to grow in spite of an empire which shudders to think there is a more powerful force in the world than it. Imagine how scared Rome was when here were a group of people who didn't believe they needed weapons. Here's a group of people who believe they didn't need violence, subversion, or revolution, and yet believed that they had more power 
within them than any force in the world. Paul concludes by saying, For God has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for Him as well. Imagine that little church in Philippi and a letter, just a letter, probably not even in an envelope in those days, unfolded and read aloud and what the people were able to learn from it and how they were able to grow through it as they remembered their apostle in prison. Let us pray. God, we thank you that in all situations and circumstances, you have the power and the ability to come to us and minister with us and comfort and strengthen us and forgive us and use us. Hear us today as we pray for you to do those things on our behalf. Amen. We have the opportunity every week to support the work of the kingdom of God on earth by bringing our offerings. Today we have a basket on the table uh, under the um, tent, or you can mail those um, uh, offerings in to the church. It's a blessing to be able to give, and you have been generous, and we give thanks for that. As disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, let us come together around this table to celebrate our new life in Him. Let us gather together to break the bread and to drink of the cup. In the breaking of the bread, let us confess our sins and ask His forgiveness. In the drinking from the cup, let us remember that Christ loved us so much that he shed his blood and died upon the cross so that we might have a chance of eternal life with him and his Father. As we remember the Last Supper, celebrating Christ's communion with his disciples, may we feel his living presence and know that he is ever with us. Let us pray. Gracious God, you who has given your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Lord and Savior, you who do not turn us away, but hear the concerns of our hearts, 
Today, as we begin a new week, we come to you with grateful hearts. We thank you for your many gifts, which are too numerous to count. We thank you for Jesus and his redeeming love. As we eat this bread and drink this cup, help us to remember the true sacrifice Jesus made so we can have eternal life. Let us forever remember to give thanks with a grateful heart. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope y'all have better luck at this than I do. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, a little chilly, a little sunny. Actually, I think it's kind of perfect. I mean, my hands are cold, stiffening up just a little bit. But um, we'll be one more Sunday out here. And then uh, on October the 4th, we'll be back inside. Again, I remind you that when we go back inside, if you come a little bit early, because we do have to scan uh, you for your temperature and um, uh, get everybody seated. So we'd appreciate if you do that and enter through the, uh, uh, the ramp door, if you would, and keep distance. Let's stand for our benediction. And now all glory and honor and power be with you, Lord God of heaven and earth. May you equip us and empower us to rise from this place and move out from here as, as though we have a mission to love the world and the people in it. Remind us, what you, how you, remind us what you told the Philippians to go find the joy to be strong even in the face of opposition uh, and to remember uh, the sacrifice Paul made for the church when we think about making a sacrifice for you in these days and times. Watch over, bless us and keep us and guide us in your path. For it is in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.